Poppycock Podcast with Victor Pacheco. We got a really great show for y'all, but before we hop in, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Long Beach Comedy, which takes place at Harvell's in downtown Long Beach, California, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we have award-winning dancers, celebrity drop-ins. You never know who's going to be there, but I'll tell you who will be there. Me, your boy, Victor Pacheco, every single second and fourth Tuesday of the month with new material. So come and check me out. Come and check out the shows. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to Poppycock Podcast with your host, Victor Pacheco. We got a really excellent show for y'all today That's we right. always have a great show here at poppycock podcast but today's extra special we have a five time emmy nominated writer twice emmy nominated songwriter we don't have enough time for this episode to name all of this man's credits but you've seen his work on disney nickelodeon cartoon network uh, uh dreamworks united artists touchstone pictures warner brothers um uh, he's been all over the place and now he's here uh on poppycock podcast i want to give it up for my friend mr martin olsen Victor, how are you good to see you pal great to see you too brother good to see you man oh man it's like zoom blurred out my drink just like oh no this isn't for kids this episode <laughs> is not for kids it's for adults it's it's so crazy because like i have so many questions to ask you but i think the number one question people are going to be asking at this about this episode what? is what hey how the hell do you know martin olsen <laughs> you know how how do you... no you know no no i'm serious other? I saw I'm, you in a show, and you were the funniest motherfucker there, and I wanted to know you. So that's how we know each other. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Listen, that's that's now in my bio. That's, that's exactly, in my bio now. That's what Martin, happened. Martin, you're in my bio now. I, you are you now in my, you're you in my bio. You're in my bio. <laughs> that That is a quote. That's the quote. That's the clip for the show today. But this interview is over. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so, yeah, this was crazy because this is not only just a regular comedy show. It was a Zoom comedy show. So it's like you're literally fighting for your life. And then Martin, I thought, was just a sweet, nice, you know, person, a civilian, a non a non entertainer. I thought it was Little just like a sweet know, man. Yeah. <laughs> and in all due respect, a sweet white man. <laughs> Telling me how much he appreciated how he's <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious because over Zoom, I try to, you know, I tell new jokes every week. I don't mm -hmm. even remember the set of jokes I said the night that you were there, but that was the first time I ever did those jokes on stage. And so for you to say that, that's an extra big compliment. But oh, I man, mean, for me, funny, it's like it, it's like, oh my God, I'm I'm talk okay, for the record, for those of you listening. Head writer on Phineas and Ferb on Disney. He oh, was yeah, a was writer on Rocco's Modern Life, and you were, and yeah, you were even a writer too. on the reboot that came out in 2019 with oh, some right. edgy topics that would have never took place back when the original Rocco's yeah. Modern Life took place. That's and right. so it's just, and then I saw your name there, and I was like, that's my boy right there. That's my homie. That's my writing mentor. That's my life coach right there. That's my brother. And so, like, I just, oh, it's so awesome, all the stuff that, like, okay. So I don't even know where to start. What because for, I don't know if we should start chronologically, because, like, to, to be honest with you, I have a lot of questions. For those well, you know, you could talk a little bit because I could eat my burger if you're talking. Oh, okay, cool, cool. I'm pretty good at talking and eating burgers <laughs> and eating burgers. So I totally relate. So I'm, I'm like, this is going, this is going great. I wish I just had a burger or two to match you. But um, in the meantime, you know, <laughs> it's just uh, with with, uh, with all the writing and everything. So, okay, I'm not even gonna go. I'm not gonna go in order. I'm gonna go in uh, in the order I think. Uh, yeah. that i'm dying to know i'm dying like i'm oh my god i need to know this okay <laughs> that's funny. okay okay so as a young man <clears throat> martin send batches of jokes to rodney dangerfield which were always returned with some polite notes scrawled at the bottom sorry martin according to the agent's press kit years later when writing for penn and teller in las vegas martin olsen produced comedy bits with Rodney Dangerfield, and the two yeah. became friends. Well, I got a story about that. Yes. So Rodney comes in. I hadn't <clears throat> met him before. We just I just sent him jokes all the time, and he always said, sorry, Marty, he wrote it at the bottom of the page. Okay. So this was a, a live show. It was in Las Vegas. I was producer-writer for, for Penn & Teller, 
And it was a very demanding thing. And I'm I, as a writer, I'm really good, but as a producer, I'm fucking horrible. <laughs> it's a lot of organization and it takes an organized mind that I just don't have. Rodney comes in and so up. So I'm waiting for Rodney and his wife. They they finally make it. The driver brings them in. This and there's only a couple hours before, there's like three hours before the show. <clears throat> and he um uh, I said, Hey Rodney, get uh, Oh, and he had an eye patch on. He had a big fucking white eye patch over, over one of his eyes. Oh, my God. I said, you okay? How you doing? I'm Martin Olson. I'm, we actually know each other from the past. <clears throat> I said, what do you mean? I said, uh, I used to send you jokes, 10 jokes a page, hoping I could send, sell some to you for, because it was $50 a joke. Yeah. <clears throat> he never bought any. I always wrote, sorry, I'm going to get the bottom. So... I said, I used to send you jokes like back in 19 fucking 78. He, he said, Marty Olson, Marty Olson. He says, sorry, Marty. He remembered, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So were you like, did you feel special or were you kind of like, oh shit? Oh no. Then I put, we fucking shook hands and we howled laughing because it was funny. He remembered me as a kid. <laughs> you know, he's 20 years older than me. This is like 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, obviously. I mean, I know you didn't go to high school with him or anything. Jesus <laughs> Christ, come on, man. I mean, so, uh, I did my research, and that would have been like famous alumni. Uh, oh, but uh, So I get more of the story. You want to hear the whole thing? Oh, of course. I'm trying to interrupt. No, I mean, it's fucked up. So oh, they, they definitely want to hear it. He says, Marty, uh, listen, uh, my eye, I got a fucked up eye. I just had a infection, but it's going to be okay. They, they said I, I can use makeup and everything will be fine. But I need some pot. Can you get me some pot? I said, Rodney, I'm not even a pot person. I mean, I smoke pot, I guess, if someone gives it to me, but I'm, I don't care about drugs or any of that shit. But I, I like, you know, a drink, I guess. He says, look, can you just ask around, see if you can get some pot? This is Las Vegas. You must be able to find some pot. So I said, Rodney, I can't get you any pot, but I'll, I'll ask around. Because <clears throat> also I'm fucking crazed because I'm a producer and I'm the shittiest producer of the world. Oh, no. So I can't keep track of stuff, but it's a live show. Yeah. And I'm in charge. So, so then I get a phone call and it's from John Schneider, Rob Schneider's brother. And John, because I wrote a movie with Rob, and John is one of the, my favorite people. Oh, nice. And he said, dude, uh, I, I said, John, what do you want? I'm in the middle of this thing. <clears throat> A, a, a shoot he said listen up metallica is in the next room at rob's office and they're reading your book i said what my book is not new party what do you mean he said they sent over to rob's production company the rough draft warner brothers had bought my the film rights to my first book which was called encyclopedia of hell and it was about the demons invading earth and eating all the humans and it was just a joke book with a story attached to it. Yeah. But it's all deadpan. <laughs> so he said, they're howling, laughing at your book, and they want to meet you. I said, what? Are you kidding me? So, because I, the, the, the honest truth was I didn't know who Metallica was. I'd heard of him. <laughs> but I'm an idiot, and I don't even buy, I buy like medieval records and shit. I don't even know any of the <laughs> I never go to concerts unless it's something weird like that. So he says, look at <laughs> I, he said, wait a minute, you're in Vegas? I said, yeah, I'm doing a Penn and Teller show. He said, they're going to be in Vegas uh, tomorrow. Are you shooting tomorrow? I said, yeah, it's t we're taping tonight and tomorrow night. <clears throat> so the next night, um, uh, oh, Rodney was too sick. And so he, they said, why don't, we just said, why don't we, we had a quick meeting. Why don't you just do the show tomorrow night? So it all worked out, right? Because of his eye. Yeah. So so the next day, the next day, uh, um, uh, 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 Rob Schneider, oh, Rodney says, hey, can you, hey, what about the pot? Can you give me some pot for <laughs> the next day? I said, Rodney, I can't get you any pot. So, and he said, it's okay. It's all right. So he was super, super nice, right? And I was, oh. I mean, you know, and I did ask some of the old crew members and they said, well, you have to go up and I have to drive someplace. I never bought pot before. I'm in fucking Vegas. I don't know what to do about buying pot <laughs> because I'm, I'm an idiot. So, so then the phone rings and it's John Schneider. Yeah. And he says, all right, they're waiting for you. 
I said, what? He says, Metallica, they're in a bar waiting for you at the Hilton because I was this show was at the Hilton. <laughs> so I'm saying, what? He says, they love your book. They want to meet you. And they're at a bar. They're, and so he, I said, write this down. So I wrote it down. And it was two hours before the fucking show starts. And so, <clears throat> and I'm a wreck. And so I call up my, so I said, all right, I'll meet, of course I'm going to meet them, but I don't, you know, I'm just, it's, I don't need this right now, but it's just so crazy. <clears throat> so, uh, so I call my wife up. I says, who's Metallica? What's, they're a big band, right? She says, you idiot. They're like the biggest band. <laughs> and just look up on the computer because the computers were just starting then. Yeah. We just started up with computers. The first, one of the first productions with computers. Look up on the computer Metallica and you can see their faces. Okay. So I run down to the office, which is underneath the, the Hilton. And I look up what they look like <laughs> and their, their story. Oh, and my wife says, and don't say anything about how you want think all music should be free because I'm an idiot. I think all music should be free. <laughs> ah, good wife, great wife. She said, great. Don't say anything about that, you fucking idiot. Because <laughs> Lars is the, is the most. Uh, uh, they, there was a big controversy happening at that time about but Napster. Exactly. Oh yeah. Oh, so this was like ninety six ish, ninety seven ish. It was ninety five. It was uh, oh, you're exactly yeah. right. That was exactly when it happened. So, so then, <laughs> so then I know who they look like, anyways, and I know vaguely about their band. <clears throat> and it's the biggest. And, and one of the things I said was, "It's the biggest band in the world." <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I'm so, busy writing. I don't got time to listen to music. Well, let's start. I'm, I told you, I'm an idiot. And besides, I'm just always writing. <laughs> I beg to so, differ. <laughs> so, so then uh, I start running like a little girl through the Hilton, which is like a fucking <laughs> maze. It's like, truly, it's like an Alice in Wonderland fucking maze. And I, I don't know the, the, I don't gamble or anything. So I don't, I don't know <laughs> hotel or anything. So right. I, I have the piece of paper that John said, go to this bar. They're waiting for you. <laughs> he says, make it fast. So I race through this and I finally find this place I, because the name was over it and the curtain was over it, black curtain. And there was this big fucking tough biker like guy out front on a stool. Yeah. I said, hey, uh, <clears throat> my name is Martin Olson. The Metallica's waiting. He says, yeah, they're inside waiting for you. Oh, so wow. He, so he pulls the curtain back and there's the door. So I walk in and it's just Lars and Kirk. Lars the drummer and Kirk the guitar player. And uh, I said, hi, I'm Martin Olson. I just wanted to, thanks for liking my book. And they both hugged me. They said, the book is the funniest book we've ever read. They went, they loved it. So, I mean, that was very unexpected. And I saw on the bar, three rows of six shots lined up. And oh, I wow. Have get, I have to produce my show in two hours. <laughs> and I'm terrible at it. <laughs> so now I have to drink fucking six shots with Metallica. What am I going to do? Not drink with Metallica? So, <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then they so then they start. They want to toast the book and they want to talk about the fucking book. It's not even published yet. It was just a manuscript that was sent out to production companies because Warner Brothers bought the rights to it before it was published. So, uh, so we started toasting the book. <laughs> And I and we were howling, laughing. They're the nicest guys ever. And I said, "Hey, listen, can you give me a quote for the cover of the book? Because it isn't published yet." And they said, "Of course." And then they both made up the quote that's on the cover now that you can see. And I quickly wrote it down. And I said, "Thank you, guys." I high fived them and everything like that. And then we drank all the rest of the fucking. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say something. You know, oh my God, I'm terrible at my job. I'm going to be ten times worse. So. Uh, <laughs> So I said, I got to get back. I'm in the middle of producing the Penn and Teller show. Yeah. You guys want to go and come backstage? And he says, we can't because we're doing a show too. That's why we're here today. We Because they flew out and yeah. they had a show in Vegas. That's why they said, well, we can meet Martin if he's in Vegas because we love his book. <laughs> so Lars gave me a big hug. A super sweet guy, by the way. And Kirk, I mean, they're both were fucking awesome guys. And plus, they liked my writing, so I mean... Just I was just about to say, 
Yeah, but they, they love your writing and then they get they get the opportunity to meet the man behind the, your, your book. It's, it's weird. So so get this. Yeah. So then I, so Lars gives me a hug. And so then then uh, Kirk has a gigantic fucking hand, by the way, he has like a Bill Cosby <laughs> sized hand. And so he checks his and, and he slips me something. I look, it's like a fucking uh, Cheech and Chong sized spliff. You know, it's a giant fucking joint. <laughs> And so I, I said, okay, hey, thanks, man. And so I run back because I'm and I'm fucking shit faced and I got lost. So I was like 20 minutes late. Oh, so no. I had an hour to go. So the first person that sees me backstage is Rodney. And then I think, holy shit, Rodney, compliments of Metallica. And I gave him this giant fucking fucking split. Yes! He lights it up right away and he's looking good. The pie patch is off. And he lights it up and says, Marty, you're the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, my God. That is. I mean, when do things, when do the stars line up like that? Never, you know? Well, well they do. It's all about being at the right place at the right yeah, time. And, and an idiot. That helps. Too. No, no, no. You know what? You know what? I'm going to expose. I'm going to expose my friend uh, Martin right now. Okay. Martin is actually one of the uh, smartest people I know, but right now he's not giving himself things. credit. No, 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 no. You might have not known who Metallica was at that's, the time. That's my point. That I'm but let idiot. me tell you something. Metallica knew who the fuck you were. <laughs> let me, you know. <laughs> and there goes my, you're not swearing during the Martin Olsen interview <laughs> part, segment of the show. So, <laughs> no, dude, I, 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 I think that that is such an incredible story. And it's just, it all lines up. It's just like from one, yeah. from one, dude, it was just a bunch of legends. A bunch of legends coming together and mm -hmm. helping each other out. Because you know what? When you're on the road, I don't know about music, but with stand-up comedy, when you're on the road, it isn't always the nicest. It always isn't always yeah. the best. You don't always get to meet people that make you laugh your ass off. And guess what? Was what? The best? what was the best road trip you took? Well, I mean, it sounds awesome. I mean, Jesus, I wish I was there. I mean, no, I mean yeah. what was your best road trip? What was your best gig? My best gig, I, I got a standing ovation with <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was my best road gig. I mean, uh, how I felt before the show and after the show are different stories, but my best show, standing ovation, 500, five hundred, at a theater. Oh, dude! So before the show, you were fucking bummed, and you didn't you thought you were gonna bomb. During that show, that on the on the road, um, I just. Uh, you know, so when you, you have you people felt way different before and after, that's why I asked. Well, no, 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 no. Because it's like, OK, so before the show, the guy got me on the show. And then yeah. when I got in his car, he told me the words, hey, bro, I don't know if I could get you paid. Then I Whoa. said, then I said, hey, bro, I'm on the fucking flyer. What the fuck do you mean? I'm not going to get paid. He's like, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe we could swing something. But no. right now we have you as a guest spot. I'm like, guest spot? But I'm on the no. fucking flyer. How am I a guest spot? It doesn't say with special guest, Victor Pacheco. At any rate, long story short, wow. um, uh, when we're in the green room, yeah. the producer of the show, who's a Mexican, who's like, hey, bro, we don't have a host, man. We need a host, you know? Really? And then I was like, I'll host the show. Yeah, for... fuck yeah, you're a great host, dude. I'll All right. fucking host it. Yeah. yeah, but I'm going to need some money for it. <laughs> you're damn right. You know, I'm not going to fucking go up there and host the whole <laughs> show for free. Sorry. Know your worth. And guess what? People say zero is a number. Zero is not a number. It's a value. Uh, that's right. So anytime somebody wants to give you zero dollars for your work, they don't respect you. So guess what? <sighs> You know, I wasn't as confident. I'm more confident now than I was then, but I was confident enough to know then. Guess what? If I'm going to be your little bitch and have to introduce everybody and make them sound like a million dollars, even though no one knows who the fuck they are, um, <clears throat> um, I wanted to do the best job possible. And I did. And I got a, I got a standing ovation hosting. I know hosting. that's because you fucking sprinkled bits in throughout the show and then you did a final piece right your final no piece. no no this was at the yeah. beginning of the show get out the, the guy could not follow me afterwards get out and he called me a hack on the ride yeah. home and told yeah. me that it's really messed up that I use Spanish during an English show and oh, I, I didn't have the confidence to tell him but hey fucko 
I read the room, yeah. and last time I checked, speaking Spanish is a skill. <laughs> so maybe if you read the room and you spoke Spanish too, you would have gotten a standing ovation. <laughs> Sorry you couldn't follow me, dog. <laughs> Sorry you... You know what I mean? And it's just fucked up because the same thing happens with any profession, any profession. You've been doing it for X amount of years and somebody's yeah. been doing it for 10 years less than you. And they they they, they did they for for whatever reason that one day they perform better than you. And you're yeah. looking at them like, holy shit, you just made me look like an amateur. And that's what happened. And so yeah. his only defense mechanism was and, and you know, I don't want to get graphic about like what was offered, but let's yeah. just say that. um I got a bunch of free. I was only supposed to get one free drink. I did not get one free drink that night. I got over 20 drinks. Each drink was at least a double or a triple. <laughs> Mr. Martin yeah. Olson, you Plus don't mean everybody brother. in the crowd was who waited up wanted to meet you and they were buying you drinks because you the, fucking killed. Dude, they asked me when my HBO special was coming out. People were asked, so, uh, two women asked me if uh, if I wanted to spend some time with them in the parking lot while the show was still going on. <laughs> so let's just say I got more. I mean, I didn't get more than a standing yeah. ovation, but I was offered more than a standing ovation <laughs> with certain parts of my body standing up. And people, <laughs> you know, at any yeah. rate, I don't want to get too graphic. But at any rate. Well, you know what? You killing like that. That's the same experience I had when I first saw you performing. Uh, because you were the funniest motherfucker there and was like, who is this fucking dude? I haven't even heard of him. And then I saw your other stuff and, uh, and you're one of the funniest guys. I mean, you're one of the funniest new comedians. Well, I've been doing it for 10 years, so maybe like the funniest like new comedian here under 10 years without TV credits because it's just like, I don't have TV credits and that's fucking me over. Like hard. Like there's people yeah. that's like, they were, they were background actors on an HBO, like Game of Thrones. It's like, and your next comic you've seen on HBO. So it sounds like they have an HBO special and it's just like, yeah, they yeah. didn't even have a fucking speaking role. Yeah. And yeah. they're getting the HBO credits and blah, 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 blah. And then yeah, they go yeah. on stage and like, I swear to God, there was this TikTok, TikTok sensation that was on the same show as me. And oh. I have this joke about choking out my wife during sex, right? <laughs> And he mysteriously had a joke about him getting choked out while he, he was having stole it. He stole it. Oh, he. Oh, well, hold on. <clears throat> oh, fuck him. He um, not only stole it, but he, he it, it was like he stole the cash bag from the bank and it ripped while he grabbed it and all the, <laughs> all the good stuff fell out. And it was he just got the money sack. So, yes, he robbed the bank, but he, he didn't get any good from it. Of it. He did a really he, shitty version. Oh, of his version was so it wasn't believable. Yeah. My story was based on a true story. Yeah. And that's what makes comedy authentic. That's what makes entertainment authentic. But or if you're a great liar, I am not a great liar. I'm not even a good liar. I suck at lying. I'm the worst fucking liar on the planet. So let me just go on record saying. But no, no. I mean, there's like a lot of things because like like that I want to talk to you about. And here's the thing, though, too. Another thing, I don't know if you want to change subjects or how you want to do this, because to be honest, well, what they want to tell you is that in Boston, when I started out, I was like, a, <clears throat> when I'm trying to write comedy, that's one of sending Rodney Dangerfield jokes. I was a technical writer during the day and at night. Me and two other guys started the first comedy club in Boston because we all wanted to be comedy writers and we uh, there wasn't any. And the so Ding Ho. The first fucking club. No, it was actually the Comedy Connection. The Ding, <gasps> the ding Ho started after that. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Back up. What? Okay, so the comedy connection, and I'm not calling you out. I want Boston comedy history right now because I'm a California yeah. boy. Yeah. And those California boys are like, dude, yeah, bruh. <laughs> let me let, let me know more about the comedy. Okay, so check it out. <clears throat> so it was the comedy connection first. Yeah. And then 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 Barry Crimmins comes through. Then the, the next thing. that was 1978. That's so fucking old I am. And then in 19 19- in 1979, Barry Crimmins came into town and nearby, because this is in Boston, and so in Cambridge, which is next to Boston, he started the Ding Ho, which was in the in the this crazy uh, Western uh, 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 Chinese restaurant. And it was <laughs> the perfect fucking place for comedy. It was way better than the, I mean, the, the comedy connection was good because it was in the theater district and we lucked out doing it in a bar that was big. And luckily, the 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 guy who was was the manager 
liked us and 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 almost immediately because there were no fucking comedy clubs the, there were lines around the street because we had like the people who we just said comedians wanted we didn't have any comedians and so we suddenly Stephen Wright shows up his, and, yeah. and and Lenny Clark and just and, and Joe Alasky and fucking and Jay Leno came in Holy you know, shit. All these people came in all these Bostonians Jack Gallagher and fucking uh, Don oh Gavin Joe John Alasky. Gavin and so, so uh, then Barry came in, <laughs> and I said, "Who? Uh, we, we, the three of us were talking. Who started the, the comedy connection? Is it because I was the piano player? But we didn't have an act. So we just we we all each had to do an act. So I did like this writer's act, this bullshit thing where I played, uh, <laughs> you know, not not parodies, but like <laughs> fucked up songs, uh, basically <laughs> to the audience. And I showed a movie because I made like Super Eight films." And uh, and I used to have a guest come in. <laughs> I would have an actor come in dressed like in an evening gown. This guy, on a street, <laughs> he'd have a sheet over him, and, and like I would start playing and all this stuff. And then I say, now now I have a special guest, and I just pull the sheet off this guy. And then he would immediately go into his bit. You know what I mean? It was really fucking funny. Then he was done. He'd sit back on this thing, and I'd cover him up with the thing. <laughs> but we didn't have any. Uh, we didn't have any. Uh, 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 comedian so but then when i saw the first night and every single night for five for years Stephen wright his whole act began and all these guys and the funniest guy i think was lenny clark you know and what lenny, I, I i out of all those guys he was the the one guy that stood out during the the rodney dangerfield young comedian special on hbo he he, you, you have no idea what he was like is he was like a surrealist because he turned into being like a one one line type of crazy fucking <laughs> but, Sorry. but he he used to come in and do the crazy fucking shit he had we would have puppets and he'd have he would he would did this thing with these uh these uh, uh, uh glowing things he brought in and he would hypnotize the audience he it, it, it was just the funniest shit ever he did wait could he actually oh. hypnotize him? Or no, was no, no. It was all a put on. And he had it worked out. And it was fucking killed. He was the funniest <laughs> motherfucker. And I, Lenny and I became roommates. And so we were roommates for a couple of years in Boston. And right next to Harvard University, <laughs> this little rundown fucking dump that this Chinese guy right Yeah, the Harvard through. Square. I have it in my notes. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, that was one of my questions. Can you tell me your experience living with this up-and-coming comedian, or was he famous at the time? Because that's going to lead into my next question, because I saw you in a documentary called Call Me Lucky about Barry yeah. Crimmins, yeah. And, it's, yeah. and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But and there's a lot of crazy shit that happened in that documentary. And But let's talk yeah. about Lenny, though, in that crazy documentary where I guess apparently one night he came out with a chainsaw <laughs> and he and he and you're laughing for the record, uh, because for those who are listening just to the audio, um, <laughs> Martin's laughing because it's just like this is the crazy shit that comedy is, has always been and will always be. Uh, there's a little bit more or more like OSHA. Well, here's what it was like. First of all, Lenny and I were roommates and we got a TV. We went into, I said, why don't we just do a show? And this guy, Jim Harris, came up to us. Hey, how about a, a, like a monster movie show? And so we went into channel 38, which was the sports channel, was a UHF channel at the time. You guys don't know what that is, but it's like a off the grid type of a TV station. Like public access? Uh, no, it was a, a regular station because it was where the Boston Red Sox and the in the in the Celtics and everybody had their games and all that shit. And it was a big, big station. Oh it was shit! Off the grid. It wasn't on the regular channels one through twelve. It was on a little separate thing, channel thirty-eight. Oh shoot! So, <laughs> it was a different technological time. And that was the Lenny Clark show, right? That or was the, the Lenny Clark's Late Show. And late so show. Sorry. Between, between a monster show monster movie we had a half hour of comedy every week and Stephen wright did did this stuff and, and lenny clark was the host and and lenny was the funniest motherfucker he was so hilarious and and he and i would write the show and so we did that for two years and we finally were fired <laughs> i didn't want to bring this up because it was just like hey i'm painting martin in the positive light and i saw the titles of the two segments why you guys were fired oh yeah, we were fired because up. the boss of channel 38 called us in and remember <laughs> it's a big channel so there's yeah. a lot of money involved and so on and so 
he said, he says, look at this, because he never, the guy wasn't involved with the fucking monster movie. He doesn't care what that did. But someone, his wife must have told him, what are these guys doing? And so he, <laughs> he said, I want to play something for you. And he played these two bits that we did on the Lenny Clark's Late Show, because it was a, it started off like at 11 o'clock at night and it went for as long as the movie was. It was sometimes it was there till two o'clock. So, but so one of them was a sketch uh, uh, called The Mentally Retarded uh, Faith Healer. And remember, this is in the old days when uh, Down syndrome people were called mentally retarded. It was a normal nomenclature for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that guy was because one of the guys who started off with out with us and he was 16 was Bobcat Goldthwait. Yeah. So he played the uh, mentally retarded faith healer. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and, I it, mean, it was, of course, distasteful and, and un, of course, un, indefensible, but it was a, a different time. And so and then the second thing was, uh, was uh, we did something with this black comedian called Jimmy Smith, who was the funniest motherfucker ever. And he's a Boston guy. Yeah. He was a musician. He just was the fucking coolest, funniest dude ever. He p passed away, God bless him. But I just love the guy. It was called Negro News. And so he was the host. And he did all the news stuff like with a, bl with a black slant. <laughs> <laughs> And, that sounds so funny. And the, That's... Guy, and the guy, and needless to say, it wasn't politically correct. So the guy said, what is this? It's like he's licking this other guy's hand. What is this? And he says, look, you're fired. You know, so. Oh, so, no. So we get fired. For, but it's okay, because we did it for two years. And it was too hard to come up with all that stuff. Half hour of comedy a week. Well, yeah, that that's beyond like I mean, like Chappelle's show, like even then that a team like like it was just not so many episodes. Well, we, and had, not so frequently. we had Jack Gallagher also writing with us and Don Gavin wrote some stuff. I mean, everybody contributed uh, Dennis Leary. Everybody did a bit every week that they wrote, you know. So oh, like, wow. Yeah, they did a, uh, like a, a filmed bit. Well, so that's what came in as a guest. Well, that's why it lasted two years and not two episodes, because you had a bunch of I mean, the Dana Carvey show didn't last that long. And they had a plethora of A-list stars now. Oh, my you know, God. Steve that was a masterpiece of madness. That was. Uh, that was thank like, you. Oh, my God. Thank you. And like, sorry, that, that wasn't even one of my questions. I'm just talking to you as like a. Like, 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 like that was just like, okay, ahead of its time, you know, the oh my God, ne yeah. Negro news or whatever it's called ahead of its time. Also, it was they did the uh, commercials in the TV show, like in the old Jack Benny show with, with, with that, with, with the Dana Carvey show. So they would do the commercials on in the show. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I saw the documentary too funny to fail and mm. on Hulu. And I was just like, that's that, that, that was, wait how did that fail yeah. because there's so many talented people and it was just a great documentary but speaking of great documentaries yeah <clears throat> um so this is the thing i just met martin in december of 2021 yeah but i've known martin my whole life because he, he wrote on rocker's modern life and so like his funniness like got to me even before i met him i told him this when I met him, but the, I'm not kissing your ass. I'm just telling you, you're part of my, you're part of my childhood, even before I met you. No, I mean, how great is that? I lucked out doing kid shows because it's so lucrative writing music for them. And also it, people remember it. And they said, you know, that really helped shape my childhood. And it's just so fucking wonderful to hear that. So uh, thanks. Dude. Okay. Okay. Hey, dude, seriously. You. Cheers. And also, even though it was a cartoon heifer, and the turtle, Phil, Phil, Phil Filbert, Filbert. Yeah. Oh, no, you, you know, I remember it. I was just trying to remember. <laughs> I was just, but I'm in the moment. But, you know, okay. I'm going to have a couple things to talk about that. But it's just like, listen, Filbert was plus size. And so was Heifer. Heifer was a freaking cow. So, yeah. like, even though it was a cartoon, a lot of fat people or fat persons yeah. are not represented or are given yeah. in a negative light. But yeah, not man. them. 
Filbert was a little bit shy. He was terrible. Yeah. He would put his head down inside yeah. of the show when he got nervous and stuff. Yeah. And so speaking of that, okay, wow. Okay, so I was okay. So I skipped over the the, the documentary question about call me lucky. So let me let's just okay. talk about Filbert. No, no, no. I love you. I just want to make sure that we're okay. <laughs> That's just that's the whole point. I want to make sure hey, we're okay with that. Okay. Because like, listen, so yeah. like, okay. So with the new reboot of the Rocco's modern life that was uh, streaming on, it was called Rocco's modern life, static cling 2019. It's like a, a continuation from when um, Rocco's modern life concluded on Nickelodeon and then Netflix for, uh, picked it up and um, I watched it. And spoiler alert, spoiler alert. I got to say that spoiler alert. If you have not seen this, first of all, you're too late. I'm going to spoil it right now in this next question I'm going to ask. So yeah. <clears throat> I saw this three times. This, this, oh, thanks, and, man. no, no, no. And for me, it's just like, I, I, I won't watch it more than once if I don't like it. Dude, I was we very happy with it. We were, we couldn't believe we got away with it. So oh, you guys and gals or non-binaries or whoever was involved <laughs> killed it. Killed it. You know what? Also, though, too, it also felt like you all never stopped making Rocco's Modern Life. And Ooh. it had that genuine feel like, oh, my God, you have the original writers, you have the yeah. original voices. The whole sh the whole yeah. thing was just beautiful. So anyway, I, I don't because Joe Murray, who's a genius, by the way, one of the nicest guys, most fun guys to work with, he got Cosmo Sturgeson to do to direct it. And that was his partner. And that guy is so funny and so, so, eight, so talented at recreating the vibe of the original series. Yes. The speed, because the timing of it was the same. The original series was fucking out of control. And this guy, Cosmo, yeah. he reproduced and later he did uh, Cupheads he's directed all that shit so he's like one of the best uh, uh cartoon directors oh dude i mean but 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 like the way i was looking at it was like i wasn't expecting the turns that turned out to happen with ralph bighead and his transformation well you know what happened about that is we said because joe said look at netflix or wants us to do a, either the continue the series or do a a, a film and so both Doug Lawrence, Doug Lawrence, it was Doug, Joe out of the blue, 20 years later after the show, I mean, we're all still friends, but we don't see each other anymore. Right. But we love each other because it was, we had so much fucking fun. 20 years later, he calls out of the blue and says, hey, I just called Doug Lawrence. He said, yes, uh, I'm doing a, a, a either a show again or a film. He says, you want to meet with me about it? And I said, fuck yeah. <laughs> yes. And so it just so happened we all were free, you know? And so so then uh, Doug Lawrence is now, by the way, he at the time, because he he's now the main writer, director, head writer of SpongeBob. So he's, oh my goodness. he's always been one of the funniest writers that I've ever met. And also one of the funniest artists. He's just like, a, so that's why Joe called him and I, because we, wrote more episodes than anybody else i think um so at any rate the problem was he said so what do we do should we do a film or should we do a tv show? i said let's not do a tv series it's too big a commitment and how do you keep we already did a killer show and correct i love that three, show at the end of those three or four seasons we were running out of ideas anyway <laughs> he says why don't we do a film he says yeah let's do a film right he says but then how do we fucking do that because it's Rocco's modern life 20 years later. There weren't even cell phones then. There wasn't anything. Right. You guys handled that perfectly, by the way. Oh, my God. So then we said, wait a minute. <laughs> there. What if we just make one of the characters uh, have a tra transition and, and, and have a and, and change from change gender? And because that would be if we handle it right, it would be the uh, Rocco's modern fucking life. And if we handle it correctly, it would be fucking a great thing to do as a forward reaching thing to do for, yeah. for, for, a kid, for a kid show, to do it in a tasteful, cool way and to make it just like a normal thing. It's okay. So initially, because I was kind of a jerk, I said, oh, then they say, yeah, you, what are you, a girl? And then they say, no, they don't, <laughs> even, they don't even talk about it. They just said, oh, cool. And I said, yeah, that's how we handle it. Ralph 
even in the series, because I, I watched that show religiously because even though we right. weren't rich growing up, my dad had a black box. So we watched mm. all the free shows on Nickelodeon, watch all the pay-per-view <laughs> fights and all the I porno and all that shit. So wow, all due respect, so <laughs> all due respect, Mr. Nobody should pay for music. Well, in our fucking half family, no one should pay for fucking premium <laughs> cable, okay? So my point being is that <laughs> guess, what, Martin? guess what? Hey, I grew up watching Rocco's Modern Life and you know, this whole, okay. So I watched that as a kid. So then yeah. with my wife, I'm yeah. watching, oh, it's like, holy shit. We're in the pandemic. Netflix yeah. picked it up. Let me watch this. Right. I hadn't met you at the time, so I'm not biased or anything. So I'm not yeah. like, oh, that's my friend. I got to like this. <laughs> no, I watch this un with no bias whatsoever. And I'm watching this and I'm like, oh, my God, did Rocco's Modern Life just do a trans transgender thing with one of the characters because like you know ralph bighead wasn't like a main character the big heads yeah. yes but you know for that to take that turn yeah. the way that it did it really impressed me because i was like holy shit not only did you guys do that yeah you did it excellently the execution of it like i felt empowered afterwards well you know what the beauty of it was that ralph the character who did change gender um he he was just missing for a while and they were searching him up because he created the favorite tv show of rocco and and heifer and filbert and so they had to seek him out and he he had gone on a, 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 a to live like a hermit just out in the woods because he's an artist uh -huh. and they had to track him down and then they just found out that he had transitioned and so oh what, my god so it worked out because then it wasn't like, oh, okay. It wasn't like, it wasn't what the, what the show was about. Yeah, absolutely not. It was a kid's the show. The show was about learning about change. So it, actually it was about this in that Ralph, Ralph, who had trans, transitioned, his father, who was Rocco's neighbor. Mr. Big Ed. Who had, had not been able to accept it. His wife accepted it totally because it just wasn't. Look at he's just he's he's a woman inside a man's body, <laughs> and so right. so he wants to change. So, but the father just couldn't get past it, which is a normal thing. Right, it's a normal thing. It's a to I'll be unable to accept that. I mean, some people are more conservative than others, and it's hard for them to go with change. So the whole thing. Then Doug thought Doug Lawrence thought of this genius thing because he's a fucking genius. He said Rocco goes under the roof. And then a cloud comes over and it's the winds of change. And the cloud is actually anthropomorphized and talking to Rocco to be able to talk to, uh, to Ralph's father, yeah. Big Head, to try to help him accept change. It just was like really, really good. It was empowering, dude. I'm watching this and I'm just like, how did they reboot this after 20 years of it being off the air? And it's still because for the record, Everyone knew that whoever watched that as a kid is now in their their, their, yeah. their thirties or forties. Much more discerning. And so, no, 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 no. But but it was an adult theme, but it had a little bit more mature type yeah. of like approach than the traditional television show on Nickelodeon. Right. And so, for me watching it, I'm like, oh, Rachel Bighead, I do smell. So it's just like, you know, it's, it wasn't anything like I was ashamed of. It was more oh, like... Oh, you know, here's a cool thing. Doug and I, Doug Lawrence and I, Mr. Lawrence, uh, we kind of, as we were going up, I said, hey, we got to talk to Joe. He says, you mean about the voice, right? I said, yeah, the voice has to be the same. He says, exactly. So he said, we have to talk to him about that. Rachel doesn't suddenly have a different voice. It's just, she, he just talks the same. He's the same person. He just changed gender. Right. Oh so, my God. So we went up there and then we said, Joe, we want to talk to you about the voice. He says, I know, I'm going to have my regular voice. And we yes. Said, yes! Exactly right. Yes. <laughs> because oh. Joe was the one that voiced Ralph Bighead. Yeah. Who, who transitioned in real life and for the show. <laughs> So no, 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 no. What I'm saying is you as one of the writers on the show and everyone else on the show, you know, were able to use real life in order to make this successful. Because to be honest with you, I watched this unbiasedly like, oh, sh there's a new Rocco's Modern Life reboot. No, it isn't a reboot. It's a continuation. It's actually a Rocco's Modern Life movie, if you want to be technical yeah. about it. Right. Oh, shit. Rocco's Modern Life didn't have a movie. I got to check this out.
So I'm checking it out just as a like, uh, you know, looking for entertainment. And I'm watching this and I'm like, dude, if this is how you introduce kids to or anybody, because there's a lot of people who are adults that are very weirded out by the transitioning of people changing Which is genders. normal because it's if some it's we're, in a, we're it's just starting. Well, I mean, the it's, ability to be able to be who you really are is just starting, and so mm-hmm. it's hard to, for some people to get used to. It's right, hard to right. But but I'm watching this as an entertainer. I'm yeah. watching this as somebody Dude, who gets that bored. was the goal. You are so right, Victor. We had to make it funny and make it without doing anything. That's why we didn't do anything funny about the about the gender switch no of course not no 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 we made that the the emotional core between the son and the father right so the whole thing was just about him trying to find him and to to remake the show that he loved yes because that was the whole obstacle in trying to find it because he was on the grid he was in the trailer he was you know and it's just i don't want to listen if you haven't watched this already go watch it Go watch it. It's funny. It's good. And when you're watching it, just hats off to Joe Murray, who created the show, who brought us in to do this. And he's the one. I think I suggested the transgender possibility because we were when we were brainstorming, what do we fucking do? It's 20 years later. How do we do do modern life? And I think I just said that as a throwaway joke. And Joe said, wait, and yeah. I mean, that's he's a fucking genius and he like sees the value. And uh, plus he was was living the show. I mean, it was his show. He lived it 24 hours a day. So it just was such a pleasure working with him and and Doug Lawrence. But like watching that as a kid Mm. on Nickelodeon was one experience and then watching it as an adult during the pandemic oh, yeah, right. when everybody was like losing their shit i'm watching right. this and i'm like this is funny this is empowering and this is yeah. just great and then i'm like and then a few months later then i meet you and i'm just like <laughs> this is surreal my life can't be real my life can't be real it can't be real i'm just like serious no no no, no. i'll do respect because i told you because you know me and martin have had lunch before or late yeah. lunch whatever if you want to be technical about it <laughs> We want to be super technical about it. We had a late lunch. I'm a fat guy. It was a late lunch. <laughs> we had beers, man. We had okay, fine. Okay. We had we had a we had a very good meeting, and so and, was and funny. I, just, I just want to state for the record that I will always you, value Mr. Martin Olson. Even yeah, though I've heard I was glad we close became to... friends. I was a fan of yours, so I was so glad that we got along. Oh God, friends! Stop saying that. You're making me <laughs> blush. I'm just kidding. Keep keep saying all this good stuff. No, listen. I can't take the compliment, but listen, I I, I legitimately like have been looking up to you, uh, and also you've given me invaluable. You've given me valuable advice that honestly. I owe you ten thousand dollars. <laughs> you owe me nothing, you idiot. You I, I'm an idiot for that, but also I'm a grateful <laughs> motherfucker for that. Also, I'm an well, idiot. you know, gratitude is the only thing that's that's the most valuable thing. So oh, well, my gratitude here is that, like, listen, I listen, I just want to go on record for just saying, look, <clears throat> I told Martin about my writing process and about what I'm going through and what I hope to accomplish. And it's funny because Martin. I wrote three things. I wrote an original stoner comedy movie. I wrote a spec spec script for the Simpsons and I wrote a children's book. Yeah. Martin's all like, Hey, 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 the spec script, whatever. I want to hear your original stuff. And so, you know what, when you said that, that really opened up like a new part of my brain that was not open before because it was just like, Oh, that's cool to be able to write characters that have already been established but as opposed to creating your own characters and establishing them so people could be on board with them that that really opened up my eyes not only that uh, martin gave me a bunch of notes about how to make my screenplay better to sell it martin was all like this is what you have to do (laughs) martin was all like hey brother in order to make this successful, just, you know what, this is a good script, but you know what, you need to really legitimately look at what other movies within this genre, yeah. what their scripts yeah. look like. And also, by the way, don't look for transcriptions. The script, 
Look yeah. for the script. Don't look for any of it because when it's transcribed, that is like the subtitles. That doesn't mean any. And it was so funny because you were like, you talked for a paragraph about the <laughs> it being a real script versus it being a transcribed <laughs> version of the script. That's because I, I just had dealt with this friend who, or this young writer who was who was a friend, and he actually didn't understand. He was using fucking transcript. I said, "What the fuck are you doing? That's not a script." <laughs> so, it wasn't me for the record. For the record, it wasn't yeah, me. Yeah, so I said, look, that's not, you have to be careful because that's not how you learn to write scripts. That's how you learn not to write scripts. A transcript doesn't even have any stage directions and shit. The most, and it's a balance between dialogue and stage directions. So, No, well, you're right. Absolutely. Listen, everything that Martin Olson says to me is gold. <laughs> Sir, no, no, I'm not even joking with you. And as a matter of fact, I reached out to one of our mutual friends. Yeah. Name Pablo Francisco, and I asked. Oh, him, he's hey, the fucking greatest man. He's the funniest motherfucker. I can't what? tell you how how much I loved working with him. You could keep no. You could tell me because this is my podcast, and I like to I like to hear my friends talking about my other friends. Because <laughs> no, 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 real talk. Here's here's a story. Here's a real story. I met Martin Olson through him watching a Zoom comedy show. Yeah. That's so right. that was just a case of happenstance, right? So I got lucky. I really got lucky to be able to meet a maverick too, because I even told you this to your face. I'm not kissing your ass. <laughs> Martin is a maverick. Martin isn't just some fucking guy off the street. He's a fucking maverick and he's humble and he's he, he's very, very nice guy. But what's funny and I'm, and I'm old. OK, yeah, you're old. But guess <laughs> what? You still get my dick hard. So who cares? <laughs> so, you know what? <laughs> not sexually. Just my fucking my artist dick. Yeah, that's right. Like, I'll stand up and show you my flaccid cock right now. <laughs> because this is going to be fucking published on YouTube. <laughs> just for the record. I, I almost feel like standing up to be like, hey, I ain't hard. But no, okay. no, no, no. You may. So, so, so regular people <laughs> who are normal would say you inspire me and you motivate me to be a better person. But here's Victor Pacheco speaking. Hey, dog, you get my dick hard. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, because listen, no, Martin. Hey. Out of everybody, though, seriously, <laughs> seriously, seriously, this is real SpaghettiOs. Nobody in Hollywood right now has shown me, uh, besides Pablo, you and Pablo, it's so funny because you're like, oh, you know Pablo? And then when I told Pablo about you, he's like, you know Martin Olsen? <laughs> that's so funny. How do you know Martin Olsen? Well, you know what, that's and, why, that's because we... He and I pitched to Comedy Central this show, which and he's the funniest motherfucker. I mean, he's he's as funny as any of the guys I started Genius. working with in Boston. He was like, and, and he was so funny, I couldn't fucking believe it. I lucked out being <laughs> paired with him, with this company to pitch the show. And first of all, he and I came up with a killer idea. And he was like, and he did all the character acting in the thing, and he's so talented. And he's during so the pitch. Every single thing he did was hilarious. And but during the pitch, the, right? He sold it in the room. It was a big, giant fucking pitch with all of the executives in the room. It was like literally 10 people at a table. And, and we were in front of them. And I was kind of more like the host and setting up the premise and everything. And then he just went off. And he's the funniest guy. I mean, he's so funny. And we sold it in the room. I just got to say, though, for the record, the story that you have about that incident versus the story that Pablo Francisco has about that incident are two what different stories. What do you say? Okay, there's what he said. <laughs> yeah, dude. Martin got us in at the door, man. He just came in there, man. He was charming with his blue eyes. And you know what I mean? He just sold it, man. He's professional, man. I mean, the fact that you're friends with him, dude. How are you friends with him again? <laughs> and then I was just like, I met him from a Zoom comedy show, and he sent me a message to tell me that was hilarious or hysterical. It was one of those H words, but it wasn't like go to hell. That's right. it was uh, so it was one of those like, oh, cool. It was a it's a, it's a white guy, and like he, and not just because you're a white guy, because I'm not racist. I love white well, people. Pablo is very modest because we wouldn't have sold. You were modest. Too. You're just like, oh, I'm just some writer in LA. So no, I'm a good writer. I know what I'm fucking doing. I know what you're you know I'm not I know what fucking you're... funny. I'm not a funny person. I'm not a comedian. Listen, so he was Martin. the guy who made they were howling fucking lap. Look at Victor, I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm telling All you. All of those executives were they could had they had were putting up their hands for us to stop because they were roaring laughing at Pablo. 
And you told me this in confidence, and I'll say it right now, that you told me that you've been in hundreds, if not thousands of pitch meetings. Well, hundreds. <laughs> hundreds. Okay, whatever. That's still impressive. Even if it's over one. If you had 101, which I know it's not. That's because I'm like a thousand years old. So. Oh, yeah. A thousand years old, but fucking you're just a fucking rock hard stud. Okay, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. You be a thousand years old. You're like one of those fucking one of those fucking mummies that comes back to life to seduce people. So anyway, so that's why that's so if, if, if you're fucking saying you're old, which you're not old and, oh. uh, and because no, 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 no. I mean, it's for the bottom of my heart, because if you're old then I'm, I, 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 I'm your senior because like, you know, we're way past our bedtimes right now, especially mine. And so like, we're having a good time, but no, listen, like the, the way the listen, and it's so funny because when I told Pablo that I'm friends with you and how we met, he was just like, well, you are hilarious, so I do believe yeah. that. And so for him to say it was so funny. What because, a good thing for him to say. That's what a good fucking guy he is because he cuts right to it to, for the truth. You know? Yeah, and no, it was funny because I asked Pablo for fucking advice that has nothing to do with stand-up. Oh. And so I was it was funny as fuck because <clears throat> I was like, Hey dude, I'm interviewing Martin Olson today. And so I have a question. Do you want me to ask him anything? Possibly? And yeah. he said this. Yeah, man. Hey, can you like ask him if I get his number? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> I've already asked him like two times. And one time he cursed me out after you told me not to curse in front of him. And I love Bob. Bob was my brother. I love Bob. No, seriously. I've told him shit. I've never told people anyone before. Anyone. I so, just loved working with him because he was first of all, he was a, he was a stand up fucking guy. And he was and I didn't know him at the time. Yeah. And we had to get together quick and figure out this pitch. It was complicated because you have to figure out an entire show. <laughs> and he and I just went boom, 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 boom. And he was so fucking funny because he did all these characters. And so I just would come up with a fucking hop ass idea for this and that. And he would fucking make it real. He would say, oh, you mean like this? And so then. Then he'd act that so out. I picked it up. It was only like about six pages. And I gave it to him. I said, can you fucking fix this up? And he punched the thing up. And you know what I mean? It just was like a perfect dude, a, a perfect storm. Of, I got to uh, tell you, man, like, and it sucks because Pablo is actually my friend. You're my friend, too. Mm -hmm. But I know you I, listen. When I hit a Pablo and I like sometimes like I'm in the living room, my wife comes up to me and she says, Shh. <laughs> like, I'm too loud. And like, and then, and then after I get up the phone, she's like, is he really that funny? I'm like, oh, my God, do you like if you're you're not even in the room with me, I'm biting the inside of my mouth and not laugh louder because I know I'm already laughing super loud. I think Pablo is one of the funniest people I have ever worked with, and I only work with him for maybe like three or four weeks. Well, let me, let me let me tell you something, dude. Uh, Pablo thinks the world of you. Yeah, Pablo, likewise. dude, no, seriously. And that, that makes me feel good because when I told him that, that we were friends and that you read my script and that you were like being really, really, really like helping me as a, because you could, you could have told me without saying it, Hey, you know what? I don't got time for this. Well, it's funny about you. This is what really, I got to state this for the record. This is, there's a podcast going on record. What? So uh, I meet up, I meet up with Martin Olson. Excuse me. No, 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 you're excused. You, you Here's the Pablo, by the way. Oh, for, yeah, this Pablo, for Pablo, I miss you. I loved working with you, dude. So oh, me, me too. He's the best. But I also love working with Martin Olson, even if I'm not working with him professionally on a professional project, because I'll tell you what, Martin, hey, you have seriously helped me with the writing more so than anyone's ever helped me with just anything. Because to be honest with you, huh. Because like it was like you watch that Zoom comedy show and then I was just like, oh, cool. That This is a nice guy that was saying you a nice what, thing uh, about let me. Let me stop you right here. No, 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 no. no Wikipedia, you. Dude, you. No, 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 no. You're you. humble. You're too no, humble. I'm telling you, here's okay. why I'm stopping you because you're being a fucking jerk. You <laughs> then, said, then I said, so you've been, yeah, I've been writing a bunch of stuff. And you wrote an entire fucking screenplay. And then you wrote a, you did what I did when I started up. I wrote a script in every category before I, that's how I got started. And so you wrote a fucking original screenplay, which is what I did. You did a, 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 a sitcom script, spec script, which is what I did. And you did, I mean, and you did this book. That's what I did too. So, so, book. In other words, yeah, but that's, so 
So I'm saying that you did the fucking work. And so you know, I wasn't fucking around. You know, I wasn't just yes, being a little exactly bit, right? right. Exactly correct. And that's what helped me with gaining your respect. In addition yeah, to right. fucking killing it that one night when you were on exactly. Zoom, when I was on Zoom. I, said, I, remember, and, I told my wife, I said, holy shit, this Victor guy, he fucking did the work. <laughs> <laughs> and so, dude, I was working my heart out because people criticized me after seven weeks yeah. because I was doing that show every single Saturday yeah. and people called me up. People sent me messages after week seven. They're like, hey, bro, you're funny, but I've literally know every single premise and punchline you have. So do you mind like doing new? So this is what happened after they said that I was like, you know what? Uh... Fuck you. You know what? <laughs> Fuck you. You know what? I could come up with new shit every single week. I'm gonna rock. No, 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 for real, for real. No, no, no. Fuck you. You ain't gonna call. Not you, Martin. The guy calling me. Out. This guy calling me out. This fucking piece of shit has no fucking balls to ever fucking go on stage or fucking do anything to fucking make their life better and entertain people. So they have, but they have the balls to call me out about how they know every single one of my punchlines. So guess what, motherfucker? Damn. Guess what? I'm going to fucking write new jokes every single week. And because of that criticism now, ah. I wrote over three hours of new material. Dude, you three. know what? You just pointed out something that's one of the biggest truisms. I mean, in my life, it was my enemies have been my greatest fucking allies. Because when I get criticism about shit, <laughs> I fucking say, fuck this shit. And, and exactly what you just said, I'm going to fucking, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah so my haters are actually my cheerleaders and they don't even know it your haters are your biggest fucking allies because if you have if you're a man and you if you're a strong person and you fucking then stand up to the fucking plate and like address it you don't like whip out and say oh fuck and make excuses you just no. fucking fix you just fucking fix what you're doing wrong martin i got you on my side I got a lot of people on my side. Why would yeah. I f try to fuck that up? <laughs> no, no, no. Honestly, no, sir. You dressed up for my podcast. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> you dressed up and, and you're wearing normal Martin attire, which is like <laughs> fucking like Hollywood chic. No matter who sees you, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, this guy's a big time player. And I don't even <laughs> just mean Hollywood. I mean, like, he is good. He well, is a good guy to know. Right in the show. Listen, there's a lot of things. Listen, whatever you saw in me that night when you seen me, that's yeah. nothing compared to what I see you. Well, because it's and great no, no. that you became friends. And plus, it was a weird coincidence that you were working with Pablo because he was one of my favorite people to work with. It was so weird. He loves you. <laughs> he loves you. We, my credibility with him went up. That's good. Knowing that I'm friends with you. I knew him only for like uh, uh, under a month and we right. sold the fucking show. Dude, and he knew you just as a writer. He knew you yeah. just as fucking. And that's the thing, though. I've been busting my dick as a stand up comic since yeah. fucking 2012. Yeah. But guess what? In 2022, when I told him, hey, I'm friends with Martin Olson, he was all like, how do you know Martin Olson? <laughs> how do you know Martin <laughs> Olson, the fucking legendary fucking writer well we gotta have composer. three of us gotta listen, have dinner and some beers let's do that listen well let's don't fuck with me because i'll go pick you up right now i'll go pick you up right now we'll, we'll fucking yeah. cut this, we'll cut this podcast short even though i said hey give me 45 minutes look you're giving me a lot more than 45 minutes but listen i'm not even done with questions my point is listen mart a you're a maverick and this is exactly what pablo said and he just said hey don't talk about me. So I was just no, he didn't say that. <laughs> he, no, 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 I'm just kidding. No, no, all no. I to he do didn't, no, no, no. He didn't say that because if he said that, I wouldn't have mentioned him at all. But listen, yeah, Pablo seriously is one of my heroes that I've known for over 20 years. And honestly, whoever wrote Rocker's Modern Life, whoever the fuck, and I told you this like when we had lunch, I was like, Hey, dude, I didn't even know who you were by name, but like, dude, yeah. you're part of my childhood. You're yeah. part of my upbringing. You're part of like, yeah. ser seriously, like no matter what, I mean, to you, that might have been like a fucking like cush job where you work on Nickelodeon and, you know, you're doing your thing to make a living. But to do it, to be honest with you, man, like it, it was a really important time in my life because I was learning English. Yeah. You were, or you were right. on one of, oh, my God. Is that right? Yeah. You were part of one <clears throat> of the shows that helped me learn English. Oh, my God. I didn't get that before. Wow. No, no, of course not. I didn't want to say that because I want to sound like a fucking like oh, and you taught me English. Damn, Martin. <laughs> 
You know, you know, Martin, let me tell you something, Martin. When it comes to speaking English, you came through really well for me because all these other motherfuckers, they, 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 they didn't come through. Okay. But with my friend Martin Olsen, who's been my friend since 2021, it's okay because you know what, baby? When it comes to Martin Olsen, he's he's on my team. That's and he right. doesn't want me to fail. He doesn't That's want me right. to make, well, he doesn't want to make me look like an asshole. That's right. And so guess what, Martin? You know what, dude? Brother? Yeah. My big uncle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't have daddy issues, otherwise I call you daddy. <laughs> <laughs> You've been honestly, seriously, a really positive impact on my life. Not just let's, like with, and with goal, just, because, because to be honest with you, because I told myself, hey, listen, you can't move to L.A. until you have 60 minutes. Yeah, that's right. But at three trips, at three different projects with me that you had no idea about. And I had no idea you didn't give a fuck about me. So the truth is, it's just like when you sent me that message, just had a kindness to be like, hey, you were hilarious or hysterical. Those words you were hysterical. Yep. And I legitimately like it made me feel good because I was like, oh, cool. It's a white man. Not mistaken. Not, <laughs> not, not complaining about me talking about choking on my wife. And I get all of my ideas about having sex from watching rough, rough, <laughs> hardcore porno. Well, you, you know, know, it's, just like, it's even no. worse because it's a white man who doesn't even know who fucking Metallica is. Dude, listen, the white man who I'll, I'll take a drink of that. Because to be honest with you, listen, Metallica, you don't have to know about Metallica, Martin, but Metallica knew about Martin Olsen. And so guess what? What does that say? What does that say? Oh, what does that say? Guess what, dude? You got an extra copy of that book? I'm going to buy it off you personally, but you got to sign it. I'm not even hey. fucking around. I'll fucking go right now. Let's go, listen, listen, I got to I got to. Uh, ask people to come to my book signing. When is it? It's on October 29th in about three weeks in, in LA. Oh, in LA. And well, okay. So this is going to be at 7 p.m. at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles. That's Angeles. right. That's right. That's right, brother. <laughs> I got your back, dude. I got Thank your you, back. Pal. Listen, if you don't go <laughs> to this fucking signing, you're an asshole for the record because I'm going to be there. I'll buy your book right then and there. Actually, a matter of fact, let me buy your book in person so you get the cash straight up. And then I'm going to show <laughs> up and then have you sign it. All right. Well, the publishers, so, what happened was the book came out during the COVID. And so, yeah. So it just was bad timing. And so, no, now, no, no, no. Listen, we, listen. Now I get the book up. So now I'm going to start doing book signings. And this is the big one because all the comedians are going to be there. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, Dan and Swampy from Disney are going to host it. And and I think that Bobcat Goldthwait is going to come. That's awesome. In and Eddie Pepitone, I think, is going to be in. And uh, uh, okay, so what you're saying is I have, these, to, I have to go and cancel. And musicians are going to be there, and so and it's a it's a benefit for my favorite library. And libraries, are, as you know, are having trouble, and it's the Philosophical Research Society, which is on Los Feliz. And it's on October 29th at seven o'clock at night. And I guess I'll put a link down. We'll put a no, link. No, no, I'm gonna put a link down. You're gonna send it to me, and I'm gonna put it on the bio for this episode. And yeah. and to be honest with you, because I want everyone to go because you are a genius. Well, see if you can go, dude. Because really, I, listen, it, listen. I don't, I'm not trying to. Get, I'm not one of these people that's like, oh, I'm only gonna go if I get a set. Listen, <laughs> I want. I want to watch. I want to watch a list type of shit a type of production a type of show and listen martin listen i've been begging for this interview for months people well, don't I'm even so, know. i'm so sorry i've been so fucking no sick no no no, no, no. Old, you're dude. busy I'm listen old. listen no no don't apologize i'm just saying i'm just telling the people listen out of all the people that i've met while i was while i've been living down here in socal Martin yeah. has been the realist, one of the realists. Yeah. You have helped me with, you gave me notes on the 140 page stoner comedy movie I wrote. Well, you know what, dude? The main Martin, thing I owe you like 10 grand. You know that, right? <laughs> you know I'm that, so right? I'm so glad that you were open to meeting up with 
it's probably the best writers group I've ever seen. And, and, and this isn't fucking Los Angeles. Yeah, let me talk to you more about it off, off, off the camera. No, no, real talk. No, no, because I told him straight up. I was just like, Get hey, dude. Out. Listen, we talked about, listen, Mark, yay. Me and Martin are friends besides this podcast. Well, why not mention it then? No, it is the best writing. writers group. You know why, Martin? Because I called you out one time when you were at a fucking... I what? called you out by name because I heard your laugh, and I was like, I know that laugh. <laughs> I know that laugh. I was like, hey, what's up, Martin? And then, woof, you went mute. Like, okay, dude, I get it. What, was the, it, uh, what was the circumstance? What, what the circumstances, it was a script, a live script read. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. and I heard you cackle. Because, I heard you go... <laughs> So here's you, the thing. you cackled. It was one <laughs> type of cough. I was like, "Oh, Martin's here." <laughs> oh, you know, I was so sick then, and I had a sick no, no, no. But listen, no, no, no. You look good. You sound good. And it's just like, here's the thing. I'm a little better now, but now I have a dip. Now I had the flu. <laughs> no, well, listen, it was better flu than the COVID. Let me yeah, just say, right. we didn't, my just, wife and I didn't get COVID, so we lucked out. That's good when you guys are killing it. Then, you but guys are I gotta super... tell you, I want to plug Connor's thing. It's the fucking well, good, let's plug Connor's thing. Only writers, it's only writers.rn.com. It's, it's, it's co. Just look up only writers, writers group, and it's, only writers writing group. Look it up, it's like $11 a month. Oh it's, my god, it's so fucking good. And dude, they, it's so cheap for the amount yes. of information that's available on that resource. Plus, and, they have get togethers at Connor's place, which is in Eagle Rock, I think. And I forget what town he was. I was over there many times, but his mother is my writing partner. Ooh, I didn't know that. <laughs> listen, listen. His mother I, was my writing partner for 30 years. Jesus. Okay, no wonder you recommended me to the group. Okay, listen. No, I'll, because I'll, it was the best group, and plus he created. We no, fucking workaholics. Central workaholics. Yeah, he's, baby. And he's the best fucking writing coach and the, oh be, like, the best writing Listen, group. Mart, 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 Mart. For you to say that somebody is the best writing coach ever. It's true. After all the accolades that you have accomplished yourself. Yeah, but guess I'm what not that a tells writing me coach. About I'm you. a fucking writer, you know? Yeah, but guess what? You're a motherfucking writer, too. And you're a fucking badass motherfucker. <laughs> and I told myself, hey, don't cuss during the Martin Olsen interview because you don't want to make him fucking feel uncomfortable. But guess what? I can't help but say hey, you're bad. Victor, you know what? If anybody out there is a is a, a starting writer, the whole trick of all of Hollywood now is networking. It really, it always has been. And Connor Pritchard's group, which is called Only Writers, look it up, just Google it. It's the best fucking group I've ever seen because they have two table reads a week of, of members scripts yeah. i mean it's unthinkable and all of the people who are in the group uh, do, do take a role in the fucking yes script. i showed up look martin real talk yeah. on a monday or was it thursday i forgot which one it was one of those two yeah. days i showed up for a table read Did i you? wasn't i wasn't reading and you weren't reading either yeah and i saw you in there and i was just like oh that's so funny hey I just recognized Martin's laugh, and I called you out in front of everybody. I called you out in front of everybody because guess what? I didn't give a fuck. I didn't give a fuck. I was just like, hey, guess what? <laughs> That's my homie right there. It's so funny because I knew Connor when he was like a baby, and so uh -huh. his father... I know his dad from the Throckmorton Theater up in the Bay. I know him from. I know his dad from the Bay. His he dad, don't know, Michael his dad Pritchard. don't know me. Michael, he don't know me. One of the funniest comedians I've ever met. Oh, he's great. So get this. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if I told you. Michael Pritchard married my wife and I. No. We signed him up to the uh, Universal Life Church. And so he presided over our wedding. Wait, through Seattle? I'm also reverend through there. Ah, you are? I swear to God. <laughs> I'll show you my fucking credentials. At Have the you went married Life. anybody? I'm going to july of 2023 no and, I had a, 
I had a meeting this morning today at uh, it was not this morning, but for me, it's morning at ele- at 1 p.m. Because I'm going to marry this couple at the uh, Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. Wow, you're kidding. No, dude, I wish I was. It was an hour and 15 minutes worth of conversation. And I was just like, I have two big gigs today and I didn't even tag you, but I wanted to tag you. But I didn't. You know what? That's a that's an honor because Michael, at, Mike, this is the first Michael Pritchard. He, we were the first per, pe- couple that he married. And after that, he married a bunch of couples. And oh, and he probably made a bunch of money. No, there's, it's for nothing. You don't do oh, no, 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 no. Hold on for a second. And so it was all just a, <laughs> just an honor to do. And so he. If you marry, like, 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 this is some of my fans reaching out to me and they wanted to pay me to do it. Oh, great. <laughs> so when you're marrying your friends, it's a different story. Like, if you ever different got married story, again totally. or want to renew your vows. Hey, and you know me. what, too? Also, because I've written for all the comedians, all the comedians flew in from Boston and and from L.A. And, and, and so it was, and we had, like, a fucking square dance outside. It was a fucking ah! big wedding. But all the comedians showed up. It was the funniest motherfucking wedding ever. And Dude. I was so grateful to Mike Pritchard for, for, for being our... Or uh, justice of the peace. <laughs> Dude, well, I mean, just the whole fucking the whole family has a lot of talent. The whole family is generous. The whole family, like, listen, you introduced me to that group, and then like yeah. I'll talk to you off the record about this. Yeah. But to be honest with you, Connor Pritchard is a gentleman. Oh my god, he's he's a gentleman. And the he's fact also that- extremely experienced and he's been in a million pitch meetings mm. and he really cares about helping people. Here's the thing, get, Martin. To become successful because Listen. he's like a, you know what I'm saying? He's No, he's- I know what you're saying, but I know what you're saying because you're successful and you already accomplished it. Yeah. And I'm telling you from like, I haven't accomplished shit as a writer. And so, but let me tell you something though. The way I approached Michael, I'm sorry, not Michael. Connor. Pritchard. Connor. No, no, no. I get the sons and sons yeah. and fathers confused sometimes. But the way I approached Connor about it was just like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm not being a bitch about it. Let me just tell you what I'm trying to do. And if you agree with it, cool. If you don't, well, then it ain't your fucking, it, it ain't the journey you want to take. Right. And I respect that because you know what? We all take different journeys to 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 get to the goals that we want to achieve we all have different goal sets and the thing is that's important is that we connect with people that are goal oriented and want to achieve things as opposed to people like you know i think it's a good idea i don't give a fuck what's a good idea i want you to tell me how you're going to execute that idea to make it real life right and so that that's the thing and it's just like you have given me valuable notes about how to be a professional writer how to be and it's so funny because i told you i had a few questions i haven't even gotten to them but who cares my point is this look martin you have been a positive impact on my life and the fact is let me ask you a couple of questions real quick before I let sure. you go. Because I'm Mexican, and if I say goodbye right now, it's going to take at least 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> so let me just say hey, real quick. Okay, so look, for the people that don't know, you were in a very, you were in a very, one of my favorite documentaries called Call Me Lucky. Yeah, it was the best. For it was the best only because, for to be honest with you, when I first saw it, I had no idea who you were. And I was just like, holy shit, this guy's making me laugh my ass off. Even though this is a very serious, 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 like, documentary. Because the first half starts off with the history of Barry Crimmins. And then the second half talks about some of the trauma that he experienced that caused him to be the person that he was. It was intense, man. It's like, because Bobcat Goldthwait, if you haven't seen his films... He does the most, he's a filmmaker. That's his main right. thing. Now. Film, uh, he writes the films and directs them and produces them. And they're the most extreme fucking comedy films or, or, or moving. I don't even know how to describe what he does. It's kind of like Andy Kaufman, what Goldthwait does. You know what? I'll do respect. Yeah. No, no, no. Bobcat is way funnier than Andy Kaufman. I'll well, do respect. Look, at, uh, Andy Kaufman made me howl because he didn't give a fuck. Okay, so, Andy Kaufman made me howl because he didn't give a fuck if Bobcat's better. 
<laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> you can tell Bobcat I said that without Bobby. the quote. Who cares? Right. You let Bobcat know. Hey, listen. You go out of your way to make sure that the audience know what the fuck the real story is, and you do yeah. a great job at it. And real talk, you're not fucking doing the fucking. Uh, you're not doing an act. You're doing. But check out Goldthwait's film, the one you just said, which is. Uh, Call me lucky. Call me lucky was the name of Barry Crimmins. Was you the were the fucking comical relief I needed after uh, a very sensitive topic. And I didn't even want, I wanted to fucking ask you about if it was cool to talk about. Guess what? We're going to talk about it because guess what? You know what? I'm watching this thing and I'm actually like, okay, so I'm watching the documentary about a comedian. So I was going to, I thought it was going to just be all about comedy, but then it took a dark turn about some. Oh my God. The darkest possible turn. The darkest possible turn. And so, so like, I, I wasn't expecting everyone, that. I was not expecting No, that. I would urge everyone to see Bobcat Goldthwait's film, Call Me Lucky, because. Call it, me lucky. You will right? not believe it. It's if like. You want to be a dick fucking, about it and watch it for free, watch it on Tubi. Don't be an <laughs> yeah, Tubi's good. Tubi's Don't be an ass. Tubi's excellent because guess what? You get fucking bombarded with a couple <laughs> of commercials and then you get gold. So who That's cares? Right. Listen, call me lucky. I saw you in it and guess what? When I when I, <laughs> when I saw you, how you look like in real life, I was like, I know this guy. Yeah. I know this guy. I know this guy. I don't know where from where from where from oh, where, so but I know him somewhere. And it was from Call Me Lucky. And it was a documentary. I don't want to look. Listen, I know I spoiled a lot of spoilers earlier, but listen, I'm a huge documentary fan. I love documentaries. And here's the thing. Your appearance on that documentary after some really heavy shit was revealed. Oh, my you God. made me laugh so hard, whether it was intentional or unintentional you're like oh my god i love barry i didn't even know this about him i don't know whether hug him or fucking shoot him <laughs> and i'm watching this not and i never met you and i'm watching this yeah. as an outsider and i'm just like this guy's hilarious this guy is legitimately talking about you. I'm like Barry was my closest. I mean, he was all of our closest friends, and he was very um, difficult too because of what he went through. No, so he and he a went lot of a... fucking. Uh, he had a lot of trauma, but Absolutely. he was also the funniest motherfucker. So, and he totally, basically, took up the slack from comedy, uh, from Comedy Connection, and 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 made, and made the Boston comedy scene great. Yeah, well, dude. that's where Stephen Wright was discovered for the Tonight Show. I mean, I was there that night. We all were there. We at the Comedy Connection at at the at the Dingho. It was the same group of comedians going to right. both clubs. It was it was the most wonderful, magical, creative place in the world at that time around 1978 through the early 80s. Well, let me ask you a question: Were you playing piano at the Comedy Connection? I was playing piano at both clubs because okay, listen, said, this, is dude, to, huh? this is not to undermine you. This is not to undermine you because listen, what? playing piano is a skill. Not any yeah. asshole could play the piano. And yeah. listen, you're multi talented. So I'm not n in no way trying to undermine you. I'm just saying that, like, listen, to play the piano or keyboard or anything while you're playing music, while fucking comedians are going on stage and doing all that, you got to fucking go with the flow. You got to go. Well, with yeah. it. You know, it's right. So right. it's just like, I really, pre I wasn't even there during the Boston comedy scene. I wasn't there at all, but I know your role. You were playing the piano at the ding hall and Barry Crimmins made it a spot that was legitimate. That was a legitimate comedy spot. And then the documentary, I learned, oh, this other spot's charging fucking $40 for a set. Well, fuck it. We're going to charge 50. This was in the That's 80s. That's right, man. That's this exactly was in the 80s. right. $50 in the 80s. Holy shit. Was a lot Barry Crimmins raised the stakes so that he and he split all the money with everyone. But the Comedy Connection, we split the money initially with everybody, too. But Barry right. Crimmins ra raised the stakes because he was such a fucking prick. And he was very competitive. <laughs> he, said, he said, fuck them. He said, <laughs> and so he said, I'm going to, and he just came. When Don Gavin and I drove cross country, one of the best comedians in Boston, and that's how I ended up meeting my wife and meeting my best friends out in, in, in LA. Um, he just stuffed money in my 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 jacket. And and then he 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 
wired me and Don money as we were driving cross country, just to f focus us to very, get money so we can fucking very do it. He was the most generous guy in the world oh and God. also the funniest. Also, for the record, I saw that documentary over twenty times. <laughs> And not because of you, all due respect. I love you, but I saw the documentary at least seven times before you were on, before I knew you, and I saw an extra thirteen times because you were on it. That's so funny. No, no, no. You have no idea. You have no idea what it means to me. That documentary changed my life. The document. For the record, I watched the documentary thinking, "Hey, this is going to be all about comedy." But then the yeah. second half. Oh my god! Took a different turn to the point where I was just like, "Oh my god, this is a great documentary!" Because I actually feel uncomfortable. Oh I actually god. feel like, "Holy shit!" Guess what? You know what? To be honest with you, man, like it was on the Joe Rogan experience on his podcast when he was promoting the promoting the 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 documentary with Bobcat. Yeah. And to be honest with you, man, like Barry. I'm sorry that he passed away, but like to be honest with you, Barry should have had a huger fucking career than he did, and I don't mean well, that. It was self-destructive, and you can understand why because of what happened to him as a. Well, child. yeah, it was self-destructive as what happened to him as a kid. But I wanted to give that guy a hug. Oh, you have no he idea. Was the, he was the warmest, most wonderful guy ever, and the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, I watched the documentary and just watching the fucking snippets of what he expects out of comedians. He yeah. wanted the best out of them because he was paying them the best. So yeah, he was you know paying what? the best. Dude, yes. that's the whole point. That's, that's the, the whole point. point. Yes. And yeah. like, listen, like, to be honest with you, like, I respect you for everything you've done in the comedy community. Seriously. Like, all the things that you've done have honestly have have paid the way for people like me who are nobodies to like seriously honestly like and it sucks Barry Crimmins should be a household name Barry Crimmins was ahead of his time Barry Crimmins told a lot of political jokes before even fucking Google or Wikipedia or any of that shit well, so to be honest with you, Barry was one of my closest friends but I I don't care about politics and I never knew anything no 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 I, I never understood politics. what he was fucking talking about. And of so I course. said, Barry, that was great. I guess the audience killed, but I don't even know what you were talking about. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Martin, that's why we're friends. But to be honest with you, to be honest with you, man, Barry was fucking ahead of his time. Barry was, was ridiculously out of his time. Yeah. And the fact of the matter that, like, you know, you know that the fucking the, the whole six degrees of separation, you know, everyone by six degrees. Yeah. That's bullshit with comedy. I know everybody by two degrees. <laughs> that's right, man. Every single person. Even yeah. by, hey, oh, if you work with Rodney. Oh, cool. You're my friend. I know Rodney. <laughs> He's been deceased for many years because what well, I know Rodney. By the way, he was the greatest guy ever, man. He was you so know what? positive and you're so... the greatest guy ever. And you well, know why? Well, Same plus reason. I gave him the biggest joint ever. Right. <laughs> Say that again. What? He was a what? I gave him the biggest joint ever from Metallica. Okay, listen, because that's from Metallica. <laughs> and they're an established band, and that was a great big joint, and you were a great big gentle giant for fucking supplying that to um somebody that was asking you for weed and you weren't even expecting it and then you got it because guess what my man martin olson guess what he's a people person he's a people you know, well, you know what, what Victor, i want to reiterate one thing is that if anyone out there can go to my fucking book signing Listen, okay. Very difficult Let's, book to, to, to. I will go there if I'm in town. Okay, it's October 29th. If it's at the October 29th, which is a philosophical night. research society in Los Feliz. Philosophical Felix. research society on, on Los Feliz. 7 p.m. Yeah. If you guys don't go to this, you're an asshole. Well, first of all, they'll fucking love it because it's all these big comedians there, and plus, my daughter's gonna sing. Okay, My listen. Olivia Olson, who is like Marceline, the vampire queen. Listen. No, no. Uh, Adventure Time. I wrote that, but guess what? Guess what? I have it in my notes right here. Did you? You play <laughs> Hudson Abadir, yeah. AKA the Lord of Evil. 
I play the Lord of Evil. Cartoon Network's Adventures. And then your real life daughter, Olivia Olsen, voices the role of his character daughter, Marceline, Marceline, the vampire queen. queen. Dude, you know what's even weirder? My daughter, when she was nine, yeah, we didn't. I mean, we're just. I'm a writer, so I don't make any money. And my wife, my daughter, was extraordinarily talented singer at that age. It was like, what the fuck? (laughs) Are you kidding me? So she took her around to auditions, you know, and she ended up being in the most, the biggest British uh, smash hit uh, fucking uh, Christmas movie of all time called Love Actually. And my daughter, Olivia, is the little girl, the little nine-year-old girl who's singing when all the movie stars are all watching her on the school show. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, Martin, a real talk though you've had a really and you continue to have so this is past tense is present tense yeah you have an amazing career i look up to you you're my hero well thanks you know what to be honest with you i don't have any more drinks left otherwise (laughs) that but i want to be honest with you i legitimately honestly like because like I thought you were kind of like hey I don't have time for your stupid podcast and the reality it was just like hey dog I'm really busy so when I get time I'll do your podcast so guess yeah, what Martin 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 Mar- 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 you've always been more than a gentleman to me and I even tell people I don't deserve Martin's friendship I've told my wife that I've let's told do I tell you that. let's do a second thing because there's all these stories I wanted to tell you that listen I whoa, have time whoa, to. whoa 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 Martin. Yeah. Are you telling me you're willing to come back again? No, let's definitely do that because I have all these stories I got to tell you that are about comedians. <laughs> oh, God. I just want to get the broad strokes. And now over yeah. here, I want you to come back. I was trying to get you to come back without trying to fucking over. Wait, well, let's do that. So okay, let's listen. wrap it up because it's been like, it's been no, like the full. Listen. I'm on Mexican time. You're on white people time. <laughs> and so, no, that's all due respect. This is like, excuse me, sir. We've been on podcast for an hour and 30 minutes, so we need Good. to shut up. But listen, Martin, I want you to come back a second time. Let's do that, dude. Because guess what? I love you. You've been a positive impact. I on love my you life. too, pal. You're so Aww, fucking funny. dude. Listen, don't make me cry. I'll cry again. <laughs> I will cry. I'll cry on my own podcast. It's happened oh, before. I, and I have a, a, a request. Yes. Next time, ask me to tell you the. <laughs> The Bill Cosby story that I have. Wow, what a great interview. Seriously, um, we're so happy to have had Mr. Martin Olson, and he said he's going to be back for part two. So uh, I can't wait for that episode to happen. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk with Mr. Martin Olson. Uh, we had such a great time here today on Poppycock Podcast. We hope you did too. And we thank you for joining us and hope to see you soon. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, do your boy a favor. Tell your friends. Tell your cool family members. Tell your cool co-workers. Let them know about the podcast. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And be sure to follow me on all social media, Puro Papi Pacheco. And check out my website at HispanicTitanic.com for future dates. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.